Good morning, St. Anne's. Uh, please pray with me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us this day. Giver of life, breathe into us that we may hear a word of truth. Draw us into communion, enable us to love, conspire to make us one with you for the sake of the world you so deeply love. Amen. For the past year or so, I have followed a Sunday morning routine that may sound familiar to some of you. Most Sunday mornings have found me in my most comfortable living room chair, ready to participate in Zoom worship with the people of St. Anne's. That chair is my Zoom seat, and maybe something like that has been true for you as well. But today's gospel reading is a drama a conversation that invites us to leave our Zoom seats and imagine ourselves instead seated in a dark circular theater around a brightly lit stage where the familiar figure of Jesus, just as we've always imagined him, is standing alone. As we look, we notice that the light spills over the edge of the stage, illuminating the first few rows so we can make out some other faces in the audience. Familiar faces, as it turns out. Uh, there's John, the beloved disciple, sitting next to Fred, who builds Habitat for Humanity Houses in his spare time. Over there is Mary Magdalene, along with Jack, who volunteers at the local food bank. And they're sitting next to Betsy, one of St. Anne's Sunday school teachers. Then there's Simon Peter, the fisherman, sitting next to Jennifer, who tutors autistic children. In other words, gathered with us around the stage for this dramatic conversation are all the tentative, less than perfect followers of Jesus. Saints like us, who are also sinners, believers like us, who often struggle to believe, betrayers like us, who've been restored by mercy and who get up in the morning to put one foot in front of another to do the best we can. As we watch, suddenly a man emerges from the darkness and walks onto the stage. His name's Nicodemus, and he's come to see Jesus. He stands there blinking, holding his hand up to shield his eyes from the glare of the spotlight as he speaks. The Bible says Nicodemus is a leader of the Jews, but somehow we recognize him. He's familiar. He's that person in our past who, when we first wrestled with faith, told us we were going overboard with this religion thing. Or maybe he's your skeptical neighbor who has no use for church, or the guy who smirks at the backwardness of people like us who pray in times of trouble, or the college roommate who wondered how anyone could believe all that junk. Whatever face we give him, he's that voice inside all of us that tells us our faith could be an illusion. In other words, even though Nicodemus realizes Jesus is up to something and has a mysterious power, even so, he's really here today as an inquisitor to put Jesus and us to the test. As we watch and listen, he starts the conversation. Rabbi, he says to Jesus, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. Ah, did you hear that? Not I know but we know. Apparently Nicodemus speaks for more than just himself. But for whom does he speak? We're not told. So my guess is that he speaks for all those who stand in the shadows, finding themselves both fascinated and threatened by Jesus, recognizing something extraordinary in him, but not yet believing. Like a moth drawn to a candle, Nicodemus comes onto the brightly lit stage but he's still a creature of the night. We know you're a teacher, he says, and even admits Jesus must come from God. But there's an implied challenge, a note of hidden sarcasm, which comes out later when he asks, how can these things be? Like all the Nicodemuses in our lives, he's saying, prove yourself to me. And each of us gathered around this stage has heard that same challenge. The world always tries to break down an experience of God into something less than that, something it can trivialize and defeat. 
Our culture sees us praying and serving, but is sure that if you go deep enough, it's all about self-fulfillment or greed or deception or habit or parental control or neurosis or the opiate of the people. Jesus insists it's none of those things, nor anything else analyzable in earthly terms. He insists that it's real and that it comes from above. The only way to understand the life of God's Spirit is to experience it. One must be born from above. In other words, you got to be there. But Nicodemus is there to argue, so he tries to force Jesus to make sense in the world's terms. Right, right, he says, can I enter a second time into my mother's womb and be born? And again, the challenge is to us as much as it is to Jesus. Some Nicodemus or another is forever saying, you claim to have a changed life, but how can these things be? You say you're a new person, but that's impossible. A leopard can't change its spot. Born anew my foot. You're the same old person with a little piety lathered on. Our wider culture tells us that our experience of God is just a complicated religious way of talking about the cake of ordinary experience with a foggy theological frosting. It's possible that you may have heard of a guy by the name of Will Campbell. He was a salty, radical, profane Baptist minister who died eight years ago this week. He was active in the civil, civil rights movement but the radical way he embraced his faith and expressed it made people very uncomfortable. He insisted that, as he put it, anyone who's not just as concerned with the immortal soul of the criminal as he is with the suffering of the victim is being less than Christian. He liked to say that Jesus died for bigots too, and if you're going to love one, you got to love them all. He once attended the trial of a Klansman accused of lynching a black man. A reporter noticed that during breaks in the trial, Campbell seemed to be on close personal terms with both the family of the murdered man and with the accused Klansman. He spent a lot of time with both. Sounding just like Nicodemus, the reporter asked him, how can you possibly be on good terms with both a man accused of a hateful racist murder and the victim's family? It's not logical. You can't care for both the Klansman and the, and the victim. Why do you think you can? And Campbell exploded into profanity and shouted, because I'm an expletive deleted Christian. <laughs> the reporter, knowing how the world's supposed to operate, couldn't even begin to hear the possibility of reconciliation coming from another plane. Couldn't admit of human interaction that's born of the spirit. Well, let's turn our attention back to the stage where the debate goes back and forth with Jesus and Nicodemus talking past each other out of different frames of reference. Jesus speaks of spirit, but Nicodemus hears only flesh. Jesus speaks of experience, and Nicodemus responds with argument. The world can't comprehend what's happened to followers of Jesus, so the Nicodemuses of the world badger us. What's happened to you? How can you justify this strange behavior? Why do you no longer believe the way we believe, what you were brought up to believe? The climactic statement comes when Jesus says, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Every Christian should memorize that statement. We speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen. For the infant church, the experience of Jesus in the Spirit was their only defense, and it's our only defense too. In arguments with their adversaries, early Christians did not advance airtight philosophical theories or theological arguments for the rightness of their doctrine. Like the woman at the well and the man born blind, they simply spoke of what they knew and testified to what they'd seen. Why does Fred build Habitat for Humanity houses and Betsy teach Sunday school and the John, the beloved disciple, fall on his knees at the sight of an empty tomb, and Jennifer care for autistic children, not because of psychological wrinkles or ontological proofs for the existence of God, but because the Spirit has spoken to them from above, and their lives are a witness to what they've experienced. An experience will always defeat an argument. There's your bumper sticker for the day. 
and experience will always defeat an argument. Today is Trinity Sunday, the one Sunday of the church year based on a doctrine rather than on a story. So let me give you the argument for the doctrine of the Trinity very simply, just by turning to pages 864 and 865 in the Book of Common Prayer, where the Athanasian Creed argues that the Trinity is a mystery that cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith, and that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian verity to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Did you get all that? Are you ready for the pop quiz? The truth is, if you haven't had an experience of God's spirit or God's presence, then the most brilliant argument about the Trinity won't make a bit of sense. But if you have had such an experience, then any argument is beside the point. Without the experience of God to which it points, the doctrine of the Trinity is babble. With that experience, you still might not be able to explain the doctrine, but you resonate to its truth. Does the world ever understand this? No. For the world, an experience of God is irritating, a confounding impossibility. Later in John's Gospel, Jesus says, light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light. Ultimately, though, as John says at the beginning, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. You want proof? That's too bad because there is none. But ask Nicodemus, the arguer, the leader of the old way. He shows up later in the gospel as a follower of the new way, a disciple of the light, one who by experience now has been born from above. And just as he asked Jesus, I can imagine Nicodemus' friends asking him, how can these things be? And with a shrug of his shoulders, he says, I can only speak of what I know. The wind blows where it chooses, and so it is, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. As we began, let's end by praying together. Father God, let the mystery of your Spirit, like the wind, blow free and strong through our hearts and souls. Let it blow a word of understanding to enlarge our vision. Let it blow a word of peace to calm our fears. Let it blow a word of hope to give us courage. Let it blow a word of love to give us joy. Let it blow new birth to give us eternal life. Teach us, O oh God, to set our sails to catch the Spirit's wind so that our lives may move in concert with your will, moving with the wild freedom and confidence of those who are your very own children. We pray this prayer through Jesus Christ, your Son, through whom we do not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. And now may God the Father keep you, may God the Son bless you, and may God's Spirit hold us all in the almighty arms of love. Amen.